And now, without further ado, giddy up. <laughs> so tonight's presentation, we'll be looking at the history of forces in New York City, and specifically within Greenwich Village, in three parts. The colonial and federal era, the 19th and early 20th centuries, and Greenwich Village. That is, how this history has been manifested in village architecture. So I wasn't able to find any evidence to suggest that the Lenape tribe had or even used horses on the island of Manhattan prior to Dutch and English settlement. We do know, however, that during the 1620s, uh, Dutch settlers imported strong and stocky horses into New Amsterdam to carry heavy loads and operate grist and sawmills. Nevertheless, in 1660, it was reported that, quote, Stuyvesant and the council informed the directors at Amsterdam that only 27 out of 50 horses shipped from Curaçao in the flyboat Eichenboom have arrived at New Amsterdam. The rest have died from want of good fodder, and that most of those which survive are so weak they can neither walk nor stand, that have to be carried in carts and on sledges from the scow and the shore to the pasture. Still, the Dutch preferred them to oxen since they were capable of clearing fields at a faster rate than the oxen. And I just wanted to note that this particular drawing, um, dated 1679 to 1680, is considered the earliest representation of a horse-drawn wagon in New York City. <laughs> and I circle it because it's awfully blurry, isn't it? <laughs> but actually on the page, it, it is a little clearer. Uh, and it's actually situated between these two windmills, which is kind of great. And this view, by the way, is looking down the Hudson along the west side of Manhattan, which is a rather unusual view if you've looked at uh, prior illustrations of the island. By the 1660s, English colonists had begun importing finer boned horses and establishing a racetrack in Hempstead, Long Island to cultivate faster breeds. In fact, it was reported that Governor Nichols had begun organizing a horse race in 1668, not for a diversion, but to improve the breed. Also during this time, trotting became popular along the wide and straight roads of Manhattan. The following year, this became an annual event under Governor Lovelace, with prizes in wheat for the winner. Around 1725, the Church Farm Course opened, most likely in Lower Manhattan, as the first racetrack in New York City, and thoroughbred horse racing continued up until the American Revolution. So it goes without saying that horses certainly were an integral part of uh, the military uh, campaign, um, but I'm going to flip to the end of the Revolution here with this portrait of George Washington on the right, which was um, based on an earlier one that the artist John Trumbull had done for Martha Washington, entitled Washington at Her Planks Point. Of that painting, Washington wrote the following diary entry. Tuesday, July 8th, 1790, sat from 9 o'clock till after 10 for Mr. John Trumbull, who was drawing a portrait of me at full length, which he intended to present to Mrs. Washington. Monday, 12th, exercised on horseback between 5 and 6 in the morning, set for Mr. Trumbull from 9 till half after 10. So this painting was commissioned by the City of New York and originally displayed in Federal Hall, and it now hangs at City Hall. It depicts George Washington and his steed just after the American Revolution, with Broadway in ruins and the last British boats and ships evacuating in the background. And so it's really between the legs of George and the horse that you can see this activity. Now there were other signal events occurring during this time after the revolution, which included the introduction of the first stagecoach line between New York City and Boston in 1784, followed by the first stagecoach line running between Albany and New York City the following year. And then four years later, we have the first hackney coach 
introduced by James Hearn, located at Cornelius Bradford's Coffee House at Old Slip. It also bears noting that by the end of the 18th century, the Common Council had prohibited horse racing on public highways and roads in response to a petition from the inhabitants of the Bowery. So as I was saying, um, the, Dutch's, uh, the Dutch settlers uh, really infatuation with the horse in terms of farming. Um, they absolutely played an important role in farming in New York City, whether they were under the ownership of regular farmers or large estate owners. And this particular watercolor shows an estate that was owned by a merchant named John R. Livingston, which was located at the intersection of Grand and Division Streets on the Lower East Side. So just to be clear, Lower East Side, tip of Manhattan here, looking across the East River. It also bears noting um, that it was this painting that inspired I. M. Phelps Stokes to chronicle the history of Manhattan between 1609 and 1909 in his sixth volume study entitled The Iconography of Manhattan. And for anybody who does this type of research, uh, you can appreciate that this is an indispensable resource for learning about the very early history of the island. So that brings us to the 19th and early 20th century and the unprecedented rise in horse culture in New York City. By 1855, the New York State Census indicated that there were 579,715 horses in the state, which averaged out to one horse for every six people. And in New York City alone, there were 4,649 stables housing a record number of 73,746 horses by 1896. So thus, we can see the rise of the horse during this time in the following areas. That is leisure and recreation, transportation, public health and safety, and commerce and industry. So although Central Park's uh, development during the mid-19th century stimulated interest in pleasure riding starting in the 1870s, the inhabitants of the city had a long infatuation with horses and recreation, even if such activities were not fully embraced by the Common Council. Some of these horse-related sports included polo matches, this is actually pleasure riding in Central Park. Uh, these are all from Harper's Weekly, except for the photo. Um, polo matches in Jerome Park. Here is a uh, horse race taking place in the early iteration of Madison Square Garden. And then we see what really became a very popular pastime, which were amateur carriage races up the Harlem speed, uh, Speedway during this time. So Jerome Park in the Bronx was the center of both the polo matches and horse races during the early 19th century, while also affording spectators the opportunity to let loose on the open road of the Harlem Speedway and get in there. In fact, amateur horse racing, uh, racing was banned between 1802 and 1821 as aristocratic and immoral. However, after the ban was repealed, harness racing grew in popularity, surpassing thoroughbred racing with New York City becoming the center of harness racing. And even prior to its annexation uh, to New York City, Queens was the most active borough, boasting the opening of four racetracks during the 19th century, followed by three in Brooklyn and two in the Bronx. In the area of pleasure riding, multiple riding academies began springing up near Central Park during the late 19th century including the Fifth Avenue Riding School, which was one of the most fashionable of its time. Uh, elsewhere, the CKG Billing Stable, designed by Guy Lowell in 1903, was located on the Speedway at West 197th Street, and evocative of a lavish stable of a country estate. And this stable allowed for stops to dismount from one's horse or park the carriage and enjoy the countryside, 
similar to what you would see you see in this illustration of Jerome Park. It's really like historic tailgating here, <laughs> tailgater parties. So horses arguably played a pivotal role during the 19th century in the areas of private and public transportation. During this time, most people relied on livery drivers for travel within New York City and stagecoaches for travel beyond. That is until the event of the steam-powered locomotive for traveling long distances. Streets during this time were filled with horseback riders, private carriages, stagecoaches, omnibuses, delivery wagons, and horse-drawn rail cars. According to The Horse in the City, and I have to do a shout out because this book, The Horse in the City, uh, actually serves as the basis for much of the resource about horses in New York City uh, for this presentation tonight. Um, this book talked about how did the horse go from being initially bred to then becoming a workhorse in the city. And what they talked about was um, the urban horse commonly had a career that began with a training per period doing light fit farm work. When the horse was broken to harness, then he hauled for a street railway firm, which then sold him to a delivery firm, which sold him to a cab firm, which sold him to a peddler. Peddlers and cabbies generally had the oldest, least sound horses. Some horses that became chronically lame on pavements were resold to farms, as were other horses that were poor feeders, but that might fare better in a grazing environment. Lameness, and then the veterinarian's pistol, was the most common end uh, for city's horses. In 1831, John Stevenson introduced the omnibus, a horse-drawn vehicle used for public transit, and then later he introduced the horse-drawn streetcar. So it's kind of important to note that this horse-drawn streetcar was the first of its kind in the world. And this uh, gentleman, John Stevenson, becomes also active in the carriage manufacturing trade in addition to designing these modes of transportation, of mass transit, I should say. So the purpose of the line was to act as a shuttle for passengers to and from 42nd Street to Lower Manhattan where steam locomotives had been banned by the city. So it was very interesting to me that um, these locomotives had to start at 42nd Street but could not go lower than that in the city. I think, you know, pollution and, of course, the danger of having tracks uh, that were at that time running at grade. So in this case, this is where the horse sort of came to the rescue and provided a means of, of efficient transit to get people to the um, to Grand Central, essentially. The length of the railway was 7.5 miles, using 162 cars and 1,159 horses. By 1858, the five principal horse-drawn street railways were carrying almost 35 million passengers a year. Now, all I can think of, because the focus of this talk is horses, can you just imagine? I mean, a workhorse sort of going through this routine, most likely six or seven days a week. I'm sure it's seven. Horses also played a pivotal role in the areas of public health and safety, especially during the Progressive Era, as witnessed by the horse-drawn ambulances, which shuttled both the sick and the injured to local hospitals, the horse-drawn wagons carrying disinfectant to distribute to underserved communities, in this case, uh, this illustration is showing um, uh, the di distribution of disinfectant uh, for a cholera outbreak to a, a low, um, to a working class community, excuse me. Also, uh, of course you can't forget sanitation, <laughs> very important. So they, they are hauling the carts that are the receptacles for these things. And then finally, in support of emergency services, such as firefighting and police protection. As early as 1840, horses began to be used to pull fire trucks for firefighting. In particular, fire horses had to be trained to run to a spot under their harness when the bell rang, wait patiently for the harness to be dropped from the ceiling, 
and then hinged. Speed to fires at high speeds, and then stand quietly and unattended by a curb while the fire raves nearby. Imagine. These are horses. <laughs> it has been noted that their drivers trained fire horses so well that when they ate and were sold to, for new tasks, like pulling calves, their new owners sometimes could not stop them from running back to their old firehouse at the sound of the fire. <laughs> In 1904, the New York City Police Department had 800 horses, which were primarily used by mounted police to control traffic jams. As a result of a training process that could take up to six months, these horses could switch leads, angle off runways, and slow down and push crowds sideways. In fact, there was one famous Pittsburgh horse that was even trained to hold Orestes' wrists in his mouth firmly enough to keep them from running but without breaking their skin. Both the police and fire horses had to ignore loud noises and crowds, which is, I think goes without saying when you're talking about firefighting and police protection. So I think this is wonderfully evocative of the role of a horse in a construction project. In this case, the old post office that was on the site where City Hall stands today, or City Hall's park stands today. A horse-based economy demanded enormous inputs of land, labor, and capital, including work tools for horses, stables, and roads, massive amounts of land for grazing and cultivating feed, employees such as grooms, farriers, horseshoers, and veterinarians, very large stables such as the Dakota stables on the Upper West Side, which also employed carriage painters, horseshoers, and wheelwrights, purchasing officers, managers, accountants, etc. And then in addition, the manufacture of horse clothing included saddles, blankets, harnesses, and whips. Other occupations included saddle makers, carriage trimmers, feeding grain suppliers, draymen, liverymen, teamsters, and hostlers. Uh, just a word, the draymen were typically the, the uh, drivers of beer trucks. The hostlers were what we would know as sort of the stable boy or stable man, which is basically tending to the stable. So by the 1830s, New York City had become the leading manufacturer of horse-drawn vehicles in the United States. Again, John Stevenson, also renowned for the production of private carriages, along with Brewster and Company, which became internationally renowned for its elegant line of carriages for the wealthy. Carriage couplings, whip sockets, nameplates, hubs, trimming and finishing hardware, gears, coach laces, and lamps that could be installed in any vehicle. So essentially, they were standardizing parts at that time. In addition, other products included tools for cleaning stables and accessories for grooming horses. And by 1850, New York City boasted the heaviest concentration of horse-drawn vehicles and component manufacturers in the US, and by 1875, these manufacturers had moved west, most likely due to the availability of land and the low, lower cost of production. Even manure was commodified. Mm -hmm. Stable keepers realized that they could help pay for the upkeep of the horses through the sale of manure for fertilizer to farmers. A lot of these farmers were out in Long Island, that's who they were doing business with, and then in turn bringing their produce into the city to market. So really, really sort of nice, sustainable cycle there. The Bull's Head Stable, which is this wonderfully evocative uh, illustration from Harper's Weekly, was located on East 23rd Street between Lex and 2nd Avenues, and was pretty big, containing 1,000 stalls. Others, such as Fisk, Door, and Carroll Stable Building and Auction Mart, designed by Horgan and Slattery in 1906, occupied a block between East 24th and 25th Streets, was essentially a seven-story horse hotel. <laughs> Featured a 67-foot wide by 200-foot long ring <laughs> that was ringed by a stadium that accommodated 1,000 spectators that was lit by a combination of electricity, windows, and skylights. In addition, the Titchener Grand Stable, located on Central Park West, between West 61st and 62nd Streets, and designed by Hill and Stout, 
was considered the last of the great horse palaces, featuring a six-story stable, crowned by a skylit show ring where horses were exercised and auctioned. And I just think it's rather interesting that the Titchener Grand, um, excuse me, Fist Door and Carroll Stable is built in 1906, which is sort of a transition period with respect to the horse and the popularity rising about the automobile. Also by the early 20th century, there were five riding schools and academies in New York City, all located within the vicinity of Central Park, that together housed over 900 saddle horses. There were also private stables housing an estimated 300 saddle horses during this time. In addition, large peddler stables housing horses and delivery equipment, such as harnesses and wagons, were located throughout the city. So the images I'm showing you here, um, in addition to the auction house, is um, this is a, a grain and feed supply. And I just sort of love this pile up of these carts of you know, people patronizing this particular establishment. Uh, this one is a carriage um, dealer. And then we've got this great livery stable here. So, despite its unorthodox, excuse me, within Greenwich Village, we can see how the rise of the horse culture permeated these four areas of village life. For example, as early as 1753, one year after the death of Admiral Sir, Sir Peter Warren, his heirs began sponsoring races on his former estate, which consisted of a 300-acre tract of land overlooking the Hudson that included a mansion known as Warren House as its centerpiece. Warren himself was a British naval officer from Ireland and a large landover uh, in New York State in general. But one can only imagine owning 300 acres of Greenwich Village property. <laughs> Despite its unorthodox street pattern, Greenwich Village had multiple connections to the horse-drawn public transportation systems that served Manhattan's grid, starting in the early 19th century. And these transportation systems included, and they're all highlighted here, the Greenwich Hotel stage, which was introduced by John B. In 1809, and ran between his Greenwich Hotel, which was located the, in the area of Christopher and Weehawken Streets, and City Hall. So he was running that that route that you see here. And I have to just um, confess that some of this is conjecture because I wasn't able to get the exact routes. So I just sort of was looking for the closest um, points from point A to point B. So John B. is kind of an interesting figure um, because he builds this hotel right across the street from a prison. That is the Newgate Prison. This was apparently quite a building of its time and attracted a lot of tourists. So he was capitalizing on that. But I think it's also interesting, too, that he was running the stage from City Hall, which one has to assume there were probably some legal convictions going on there. Or, you know, maybe there were business people that actually had to do uh, or lawyers that had to do that um, particular commute. Elegant stage coaches introduced in 1830 that were led by a team of four horses that ran between Bowling Green and Bleecker Street, facilitating a connection between the village and Yorkville uptown. So again, we've got this one running up Broadway to Bleecker, and then from Bleecker, uh, it's just a short walk or even possibly some other means of transportation to catch the 4th Avenue line that would go up to Yorkville. And that, of course, became electrified. The next is the Bleecker Street Line. This was a horse-drawn rail line that was introduced in 1864 and mostly ran along Bleecker Street, Crosby Street, and Lafayette from the West 14th Street Ferry in Chelsea to the Fulton Ferry. And I'm thinking, well, I wouldn't mind having that today. I mean, <laughs> it's actually a pretty good cross-town uh, trajectory. And then lastly is the Fifth Avenue stage, which was introduced very late in the 19th century in 1896 and operated between Bleecker Street and East 89th Street. And you can note how it's just going right through Washington Square. 
So I just have a few examples related uh, specifically to public safety. The former Washington Military Parade Ground on the side of today's Washington Square Park, excuse me, and the former 9th Police Precinct located at 133-137 Charles Street. So in 1826, the former Potter's Field in today's Washington Square Park was acquired by the city and converted into the Washington Military Parade Ground. These military parade grounds were public spaces specified by the city where volunteer militia, uh, who were responsible for the nation's defense, could train. And in this illustration, we see the 7th Regiment doing their practice sessions with the cavalry. Now, um, this is rather interesting to me because the 7th Regiment was also known as the Silk Stocking Brigade. Mm -hmm. And they are most uh, known for their association with what we know as the Park Avenue Armory. So we have actually quite a few of the Upper East Set that are coming down to Washington Square to do their drills. And of course we all know the armory itself is mammoth in size and was also a site for those types of exercises. Between 1849 and 1850, this parade ground was converted into parkland and it fell under the jurisdiction of the newly created New York City Parks Department. This one down here, the former 9th Police Precinct, was designed by John Dufay in the Romanesque Revival style between 1896 and 1897 and dedicated by Teddy Roosevelt, who was president of the New York City Board of Police Commissioners. It included a station house, cell blocks, and stables, the latter of which were accessed via these doors, this pair of metal doors here. And there was one longtime resident um, who maintained that they used to actually have a trough right outside the doors for the horses. In 1976, this was uh, converted into apartments. So even today, with its unwieldy development and outrageous architecture, Gansevoort Market has an uncanny sense of place that harkens back to its late 19th century identity as an outdoor marketplace, where farmers from outside the city could come to sell their produce, predating its transformation into a meatpacking district during the early 20th century. So horses were not only integral to the success of these farm stands, but also integral to the success of the meatpacking industry in the district and the early trucking concerns there as well. Further south, the reestablishment of the Hoboken Ferry at the foot of Christopher Street in 1841 prompted commercial interest to cluster near the riverfront. By the 1850s, blacksmiths and grain and feed warehouses were among the businesses within this commercial district. Moreover, the residents of Christopher Street included numerous smiths, stage drivers, harness providers, saddlers, wheelwrights, coachmakers, and stagehands, perhaps oh, um, owing to the burgeoning commercial retail trade that was going on around Union Square at this time. So in addition to all the goods manufactured to support the horse economy, there was also a large clothing industry to clothe coachmen and grooms in New York. And these included what they called dress livery and undress livery. So dress livery was essentially uh, the more formal attire that a coachman might wear, where the undress livery was a more casual, say, country sort of thing. This uh, particular depiction, which is Broadway between 8th and 9th streets, uh, actually shows a livery tailor so I thought that was rather interesting. So highly specialized um, in the village. And then, of course, we have this wonderful uh, shot of Gensborg Market in its heyday. So historically, wealthy New Yorkers built their stables behind their homes. However, however, after the Civil War, they situated them further away to avoid the noise and smell, often locating them on side streets where land costs were cheaper. By the late 19th and early 20th centuries, streets reserved for private and livery stables had been common. Most of the stables that were, were built on McDougall Alley were erected by the homeowners of Washington Square North and 8th Street in 1833. However, by the turn of the 20th century, the stables had fallen into disrepair until they were revitalized by neighborhood artists 
who converted them into studios and or residences. And the row became known as Art Alley du Luc, du Lux, du Lux. Among the painters and sculptors who, who converted these buildings was Frederick Trebel, uh, Guy Penn Dubois, Ernest Lawson, Henry Bush Brown, Joe Davidson, James Frazier, Daniel Chester French, Philip Martiny, and of course, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. In addition to McDougall Alley, 8th Street also offered its own commercial livery stables so that um, residents of Washington Square and 8th Street did have options. They didn't have to own their own carriage and their own horse, or if they did, they didn't have to have their own stable, they could just um, rent at the livery stable. So I have to tell you that um, one of my failings is that I get very, very deeply involved in research to the point where I feel a little bit behind, as I was feeling yesterday, in terms of putting this presentation together. And the reason being was, it was such a spectacular day yesterday. Did everybody get out? I mean, just for a little bit, it was incredible. This was just, it had to be, and I had to get out, and I had to start taking photos. More photos than I already had. So, lo and behold, I uh, arrive at Dougal Alley, and there's construction work going on on the building on the corner that faces the alley. Now, many of you probably know that this is a private alley. It's locked. There are security, surveillance cameras <laughs> mounted in various places. So, I want to say that I started by taking photos over the fence. <laughs> And then I thought, no, I, I'm, I'm going to respect the privacy. And I left. And I started photographing the other properties I'm going to show you. And I just thought, damn it. These people want to see the vestiges of Greenwich Village's equine path. So I went back and I went in. I was all in. So this is a view that is looking northeast of the north side. And then this is looking the opposite way. And so you can see that this actually is this, remarkably, because uh, this is a very early photo. Then we have this wonderful view that is looking east. And then this is the south side, and this is what is not readily visible from the street uh, further into the alley. Here's the corner building, which I'm sure all of you at one point uh, or another you've walked by, which is on McDougal Street and McDougal Alley, as you head just to North, um, excuse me, to 8th Street on, on the block ahead. This was a three-story stable with the entrance for the uh, apartments on the alley side, and the carriage entrance was on the McDougal Street side. This one I found fascinating because this was an alteration that was undertaken by Raymond Hood of Rockefeller Center fame, and um, you name it, Time Life Building. He, he has done amazing work in the 1920s and 30s and 40s in New York City. So this was just such an unusual uh, thing to see. Um, this was originally uh, actually an automobile garage, so this was a later accretion. And then just to sort of see the profiles of the buildings was rather interesting too. So Washington Muse, I think uh, NYU has an open door policy here because of course those gates are not locked. Um, this, like McDougal Alley, was serving the houses on Washington Square North and the initial development in Washington Muse was along the north side of this Muse, behind the 8th Street lots, which was of course furthest away from the townhouses on the north side of Washington Square. Of course that was intentional. Most of the stables on the north side were built in 1833 and then remodeled by Maynick and Frank in a Mediterranean revival style in 1916. And for many years, these properties were owned by Sailors Snug Harbor, which began leasing their buildings to NYU in 1949. So I just wanted to sort of walk you through the historical trajectory here. So here was 
uh, essentially the earliest shot I could find of Washington News. And then uh, you can see essentially the Mediterraneanization <laughs> of these houses, these stables that are converted into houses in 1930. Again, the same photograph, and then looking at the current today. So you just follow the canopy here, and that's essentially what you're seeing. Um, props to the Landmarks Preservation Commission, because this is looking pretty good in terms of uh, retaining its historic character. And then we've got the south side, and interestingly enough, uh, these were all constructed in 1930 as two-story houses. And as we can see, there's an architectural dialogue going on between the north and the south here with respect to this Mediterranean style. But the one that gets a lot of attention, at least when you're reading designation reports and other historical evaluations of architecture, uh, is this particular carriage house, which really does give you a sense of what um, the larger road would have looked like at one time. Uh, also, this is actually was a four-story apartment, like dormitory uh, apartment, that was built uh, during the 1860s. So that brings us to the private stables. Private stables, that is, stables that were owned by individuals to provide shelter for their horse, typically featured a carriage or wagon stall in front of the building and a stall or stalls in the back of the first floor. And then the apartment was located on the second story in the front of the building where the windows were with the hayloft in the rear. Now, I was um, curious to learn that, generally speaking, the rear stables did not have windows, which just, again, I mean, wasn't the horse's life hard enough without actually having any, but of course this had to do with smells and odors and neighbors. Uh, also, I learned that horses uh, in some situations were housed in basements, um, which is also just incredible to me. So 22 Jane Street, which we see here, was built in 1868 for Calvin Demarest, by a carpenter named Charles H. Demarest, who may have been his father or his brother, or son. It followed that the typical layout of a private, uh, small private stable, as I've just described. In this case, it had the carriage or wagon room in the front, the stall in the rear, the coachman's apartment upstairs in front, and the hayloft in the rear. This other one, 23 Cornelia Street, was designed by Charles B. Myers, who actually did a lot of apartment house designs um, around 1912. And in 1925, it was converted into a laundry. And then in 1967, it was converted into an artist studio garage with an apartment on the second floor. And I guess this building's claim to fame is that Taylor Swift rented this house for a while and wrote a song that uh, references Cornelia Street. <coughs> This is certainly one of the more, more picturesque um, former stable buildings that I came across. This is now inhabited by the Conservative Synagogue of Fifth Avenue, located at East, 11 East 11th Street. And it occupies an unusual setback that is also visible from the street. Now, you can imagine in putting this together, that was a challenge. I don't have access to people's backyards. So I, I was just looking where I could find these carriage houses to show you. Um, during the early 20th century, it was remodeled in an arts and crafts style with stucco parchment, as you can see, and then the diamond-shaped tiles as well. Now, it's unclear as to the original design of 40 West 10th Street. And so, you know, in some cases, I'm showing you the tax photo from 19, around 1940 just to give you an indication of um, a prior look, not necessarily the original look. Uh, but in this case, it was originally a stable that was converted into a studio in 1912 by Henry E. Scholl for the sculptor Charles Keck and was re-envisioned as a neo-Renaissance style townhouse, as we see. Then we have this curiosity too. Um, this is 185 West 4th Street 
which was built between 1897 and 1899 at the rear of a federal house located at 128 Washington Place. It was remodeled in 1919 from a garage into a studio, and again in 1937 from a studio into a house. It is a neo-federal style house with a design by Fred H. Fairweather. Now what's so fascinating about this to me is that this particular house, former stable, is sitting right next to some of the oldest federal, <laughs> authentically federal style grow houses in the village. Uh, and it is such a study to see this. So this later sort of reinterpretation of the federal style in the early to mid 20th century. 15 Downing Street was constructed between 1829 and 1832 as a stable, before being converted to a brewery between the late 1850s and the early 1890s. In 1892, it was reconverted into a stable that accommodated wagons on the first floor and 16 horse stalls on the second floor. I'm guessing the third floor might have been a hayloft. I'm still trying to figure out how you get 16 horses onto the second floor of this particular building, which as you can see is quite narrow. 100, um, 129 Charles Street was commissioned by Herman Thalman and designed by Henry Anderson in 1897. It was built as a livery stable and Thalman subsequently occupied the second floor with his family while renting out the stable portion below to a few livery tenants between 1897 and 1900. Upon his death in 1900, it was sold and again leased to various livery companies before being converted into a garage for trucking. And this is one of those really interesting buildings that has the horse head uh, keystone. It's one of two in the village. Other commercial stables include the New York Biscuit Stables, located in the Gansaford uh, District, which is located at 439-445 West 14th Street. This was commissioned by a descendant of John Jacob uh, Astor, who originally owned the land, and it was designed by Thomas R. Jackson. So this was built to house the horses, which served the New York Biscuit Company which then merged with the American Biscuit Company to become the National Biscuit Company. Its later iterations included a garage, warehouse, and now a soundstage. I have to say, I just think it's remarkable that on 14th Street, no less, you can see a building like this that has endured. 49 uh, Downing Street was designed in a Romanesque revival style by Werner and Windolf in 1896 as a stable and a single family dwelling for John F. Carragher, who was a, tr a truckman. Ten years later, it was leased to Borden's Condensed Milk Company and later converted into a garage. Between 1824 and 1934, the Trinity Dairy Company used it as a gar uh, garage, dairy, office, stable, and wagon storage. And then finally, in the mid-1980s, the entire building was converted into multifamily housing. And this is the other one um, that has that horse head keystone. So I think I would be remiss if I didn't just talk about the horse's perspective here and talk about you know, animal abuse, animal rights occurring during the 19th century. Um, it really is a fascinating topic that I think may have kind of pulled me in to a direction that I didn't necessarily want to go for this presentation, but fascinating nonetheless. Um, in 1865, Henry Berg founded the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And here he is, illustrated in um, Frank Leslie's. He believed that death by the slaughterhouse was preferable to death by the whip. When horses became sick, lame, or just too old to justify the money spent in feeding and stabling them, their owners had them shot. Now ironically, the ASPCA was the leading killer of horses, having shot between 1,800 and 7,000 a year in New York City between 1887 and 1897. 
And this was due to insurance requirements that prevented an owner of a horse from shooting it. And the ASPCA's credibility in making diagnoses and taking action. In 1900, over 20,595 dead horses were removed from New York City streets. I should also add, by the way, that um, we've, maybe you've come across early photographs that show like a dead horse lying in the New York City street. Uh, my understanding, at least from uh, this particular book, which is a pretty thorough academic study of horses in the city, um, maintained that these horses actually did not remain on the streets for long, that there were um, actually, there was profit to be made by uh, shipping them out to rendering plants for various products. So through the support by the city, the ASPCA played a leading role in monitoring and penalizing animal abusers. In fact, it categorized and inventoried the abuses of horses, which were chronicled in its annual report of 1884, in which it cited harness sores, beatings, lameness, abandonment or starvation, overloading, overloading, which is what you see here. This idea of piling people on a streetcar that was never meant to carry that many people, and for the reasons that the horses couldn't pull that kind of load without suffering. And of course, that would only make the driver, you know, whip them fiercer. So, I mean, there's a really sort of uh, sad trajectory there. Um, also, they cited working sick horses, just reckless driving, and that would include like speeding down hills. Imagine a very heavy carriage following a horse, and a horse, of course, going down a hill is not going to be uh, as sure-footed. Um, maliciously killing or wounding, selling diseased animals, driving horses until they die, exposing animals to storms, and salting streets, which, of course, anyone who's a dog owner knows about that and what it does to the pads of the dog's paws. So, I want to note that it bears noting that the abuse of these horses used for commercial purposes was often an outgrowth of company owners who demanded that their drivers prioritize speed over everything else. And, in fact, it also bears noting that there were companies that relied on horses to make regular deliveries of their products and had a special incentive to provide them with good housing and to maintain them in good condition. In these instances, horses were a symbol of company pride, important to their sales success, and a major capital investment. So I, 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 I think it's a, at least a little comforting to understand that this wasn't the, the total picture, um, that there were, in fact, companies that took a lot of pride in their horses um, as part of the company brand, ultimately. So I just wanted to touch on the decline of the horse in the city. So during their heyday, horses in urban centers posed a variety of problems. Uh, they needed housing and stables and space to store grain and hay for feed. There was the pollution. Uh, the average horse produces two to three gallons of urine and 30 to 50 pounds of manure per day. On the plus side, uh, this did enable Long Island to become a center for truck farming. <laughs> by the late 19th century. Uh, then, of course, the horse fatalities on the streets of New York averaged 15,000 per year, because on average, a horse only lived two to four years, that is, the urban horse, which then had to be transported to awful docks and shipped to rendering plants, which, by law, were situated away from urban centers. So, of course, this was costly. And then other factors included increasingly intolerant neighbors, who associated horses and stables with disease, as exemplified by the distemper ex uh, epidemic that occurred in the 1870s, where there were so many horses that were lost. Uh, I came across one illustration that showed people um, pulling carts where normally the horses would be doing it, uh, because there just weren't uh, enough horses to, um, to make deliveries and all. So in addition to all of this, the health boards imposed district requirements on, strict requirements on the handling and storage of manure, resulting in costs outweighing the benefits of manure sales to farmers. 
So here we now see that it's no longer cost effective for these stable owners to, um, main, to sell the manure in order to help pay for the upkeep of the stables. And then of course by 1912, the automobile and other forms of electrified mass transit had eclipsed the horse as the most popular means of travel, leading to the latter's inevitable decline. As noted in The Horse in the City, what was new was not horses themselves, but traffic, especially mixed traffic. So we're talking mixed combination of now automobiles and horses. And between 1909 and 1913, really late in the horse era, it showed that horse-drawn vehicles were still a majority of the growing volume of travel and the dismal traffic jam that had already become a conspicuous feature of modern city life. And even though this is earlier, I just love this illustration, which uh, appears to be this little girl that maybe is spooking the horse and this very flustered woman. This larger graphic is called Crossing Broadway. <laughs> and while this is going on, there are people that are just minding their own business, as we do, <laughs> through walking the streets of New York, uh, that are just quietly waiting. <laughs> but it's so funny that, that we've got this really sort of dire, uh, dramatic illustration on the front of the, the uh, picture. Uh, even though after the automobile had replaced the private carriage in the city and become the new status symbol, especially for the affluent, there was a countervailing increase in pleasure riding and horse shows during the early to mid 20th century. So interesting to note that as the horse as workhorse is declining, we have the rise of the magnificent horse for pleasure riding and for um, horse shows, competitions, really celebrating what the horse is best at doing. So lastly, I just wanted to touch on several of the vestiges of equine history that we do see in the village today. Um, this is known as the, a horse walk, which is a single passageway that goes to the back of the house, uh, usually to a stable where the horses were kept. Uh, my understanding is that there was a storage uh, unit just above this passageway. These are quite rare, as you may have um, seen. Also, the boot scrapers, which of course that's not just specific to horses, that's just about getting your boots dirty, but of course we know there was a lot of manure in the streets and that was probably a large reason for having these boot uh, scrapers. And I also want to just um, thank Sylvia Bean. Now, who is Sylvia Bean? When this blast went out about this presentation tonight, she immediately emailed me. I don't know why. I don't know why. And she said, You must see my house. And I said, Okay, where do you live? She said, 11 Mandan Street. Thank you very much. She said, I have an original passageway uh, that was for carriages. And she's right. This is very rare. Uh, there is one at 13 Leroy. But it actually was a narrower passageway that was expanded uh, for cars later on. So this is the real Megillah. And if you are around uh, Charlton, Kane, or Van Damme, you will see both these and this. So um, I do encourage you to go. And then finally, just because it is so iconic and so wonderfully evocative, uh, really I think something that people forget, which is basically how much the horse was integral to the life blood of the city during the 19th and early 20th centuries especially. Uh, and then of course, any sort of historic stable signs. This one is the Rossmer Stables, uh, which was a livery stable, but may very well have gotten its name from a nearby, the nearby Rossmer Hotel on Fifth Avenue. So today, <laughs> these are in fact, together with the carriage trade in and around Central Park, uh, really the only reminders of the horse in the city. And I thank you all for coming tonight.